Good. 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 All right. Thanks, everyone. Welcome to the 2012 World Philosophy Day event. So, uh, I'd like to thank uh, our neighbors from Detroit who made it over, to the faculty and students from the University of Windsor, members of our community, and especially the person who started this event a few years ago, Grant Yoakum. So. Before we get started, I'll turn it over to Grant to make a quick announcement. On? Can you hear me? How about now? Great. Well, um, well, thank you, Jeff, for actually taking up the torch this year. As um, some of you know, I'm actually away doing a PhD right now, uh, so that uh, takes my feet on the ground, off the ground, and puts them in another city. Right. So it's really wonderful. God, this is this is becoming quite a little tradition, isn't it? All right. Um, Jeff Reno was actually one of our first speakers at the first World Philosophy uh, Day celebration sponsored by the WPA, and uh, it's really appropriate that Jeff's taking over right now um, uh, to to actually bring this wonderful event uh, because Jeff um, is actually going to be one of the executive board members of the currently actually by the end of the month submitted and in the process of getting approval um, non-profit organization right? uh, which also will have charitable status right? so in my hand I'm holding the um, not-for-profit uh, incorporation handbook which has been a constant companion of mine over the past few weeks while filling out the paperwork and figuring out you know the bizarre sort of uh, sort of bureaucratic process that's involved in uh, becoming a non-profit and charitable organization and um, amusingly uh, the decision that we had just recently come it come to uh, Jeff Newman is going to be the other executive board member uh, for the application boo. and boo, <laughs> boo. Right? Your mom. That's a wonderful job, right? Sorry, Jeff, you're out. All right. Anybody else want to be an executive board? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. Anyhow, um, so this nonprofit status is really going to help us uh, become an institution that um, invites you to think: What will it take to turn Windsor into Shangri-La? for philosophers. Right? I mean, I've been listening to all of this Eddie Francis stuff, you know, turning Windsor into a tourist destination, that sort of thing, and I'm trying to head into the city today on my way to come to this event, and I'm wondering, okay, these hypothetical tourists, how do they even get here? Right? To the border, we have you know it's a, a really sort of impeditive kind of process. And thank you to all of our American video, uh, visitors for coming over for this event. Right? But I'm coming in via the 401, and there's 401 construction. I try to hop off at Manning Road. There's Manning Road construction. Where do I go? Do I go down Walker? No construction. Right? How do you even get into the city? Right? But once you're here, right? As philosophers, we've got to ask ourselves, what would it take to turn this place into Shangri-La for philosophers? What sort of needs do we have beyond the obvious armchairs and institutional library? Um, it's, I think largely this sort of event is that need, right? That sort of intellectual friction that occurs at these sorts of events. So that's, that's why it's great that this is it becoming a bit of a tradition here. So my first announcement is... Um, Nonprofit status coming forward, uh, and uh, my fellow executive board members, Jeff Noonan and Jeff Reno. Right? So you get two Jeffs and a grant. And uh, hopefully, uh, by the time we have our next event um, next March, right? What we will have? <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, well, you've already been booed, so. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, our next event, which is going to be in conjunction with the Undergraduate and Graduate Conference at the University of Windsor, is going to be themed on the topic, not for profit. Right? This will give us an ability to think critically about profit and value and that sort of thing, and at the same time celebrate, hopefully, if our application is successful, our nonprofit status. Right. Um, at this event, um, it's, we will be uh, awarding um, the, the, the fifth, believe it or not, fifth Stan Cunningham Prize for Public Philosophy Value to add to, uh, 
at two hundred dollars. Right? These are five five sort of awards going here, right? And this will be presented to an undergraduate student who will be given the opportunity to speak at an evening speaking engagement along with a more senior, probably alumni guest speaker on this topic, right? And it's a wonderful sort of compliment to the wonderful job that the students and faculty do um, organizing this ongoing sort of uh, undergraduate and graduate sort of powerhouse of a couple of good speaking engagements that is the conference at the University of Windsor come March. Um, and the final thing um, that I want to mention here is that um, I'm on tape right now. Okay, that's cool. I'm being recorded right now. Uh, this entire event will actually be recorded as well, right? And uh, what I will be doing is uh, putting it up on the uh, windsorphilosophy.blogspot.com for anybody who would like to revisit these events um, or uh, for anybody you know who may have actually missed this. Um, it was appreciated in last year's uh, World Philosophy Day uh, sort of mini conference event. Um, that we were able to actually put it up there for a few people who are here today that weren't able to be here last year, right? So um, hopefully that will be handy to uh, some of you, and um, thank you. And thank you to Jeff, of course. Thanks a lot, Brent. Um, and putting that up on the website is contingent on approval from Gail Presby first. So, yeah. We can talk about it after royalties, etc. <laughs> so this is the third annual World Philosophy Day event that we've had here, and it's put on by the University of Windsor Philosophy Department and the Windsor Philosophical Association. Uh, World Philosophy Day itself uh, was introduced by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization in 2005. And this occasion is intended to bring philosophical ideas into the community, which ultimately sustain us as thinkers, and not just as thinkers, but as individuals and citizens. Right? So it's an opportunity to, to reflect upon our world outside of the university, <coughs> to interrogate aspects of our daily lives that we don't often subject to critical scrutiny, and to propose new and interesting ways of thinking and acting in the world we inhabit. So over the past few years in particular, our event has focused on some of the most pressing issues facing our city the global economic catastrophe that has affected Windsor so profoundly since 2008, the loss of hundreds and thousands of jobs in the Windsor and Detroit area, and the real barriers to collective social, political, and economic change. Some of the questions animating our stage and discussions over the past few years include the following. What are the underlying causes of our unstable economic situation? What are the prospects of reconfiguring and ameliorating the conditions of our, ourselves and our fellow citizens? And what can philosophical thought offer in our effort to overcome these, our newest experiences, our most recent fears? So this year, we've decided to expand and deepen our discussion by creating a space for dialogue between Americans and Canadians. As we'll see tonight, Windsor and Detroit share many common though distinct concerns. It's particularly fitting that we should enlarge our scope to include the U.S. perspective on these issues this week for at least a couple of reasons. Um, the first, a minor one, uh, was that hundreds of people swarmed our Capitol Theater this past weekend uh, to watch a recent documentary, Detropia, uh, which addressed some of the systemic problems plaguing our neighboring city. Uh, second, and more notably, of course, uh, we just witnessed a not-so-insignificant election in American history where Barack Obama succeeded in defending his belt for the first time. <laughs> but this time around, Americans didn't seem to exude the sort of uncritical optimism that they did in the last election. Nor did they treat the president with the fanaticism they typically reserve for Hollywood celebrities. Perhaps Americans, and even Democrats, have become disenchanted, if not with Barack Obama himself, then certainly with the substantive limitations on the ability of any political leader to affect qualitative change. Limitations imposed by the economic forces driving American democracy. So, how can individuals expect their lives to improve given the ineffectual character of party politics, which promises much, but offers little in the amelioration of life conditions. And we're not just talking about ideas here, we're not just arguing about thoughts in a university, we're talking about people's livelihoods, right? So, what are some of the ways in which people can act outside of the formal, legal, or political order to take their livelihoods into their own hands? Our talks tonight address precisely these issues 
and many others. So we'll have one main speaker tonight and then a commentary by one of our professors here at the University of Windsor. So our first speaker is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Detroit Mercy. Her areas of specialization are cross-cultural and specifically African philosophy, social and political philosophy generally, and peace and nonviolence studies. <clears throat> She's the editor of the 2007 book Philo Philosophical Perspectives on the War on Terrorism and the co-editor co of Thought and Practice in African Philosophy in 2002 and two editions of the Philosophical Quest, a cross-cultural reader in 1995 and 2000. She's also published extensively on such topics as the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, racism, sexism, and a host of other pressing contemporary concerns. She's known around campus at, at UDM uh, not only for her indefatigable work in the community, but also for her work in Africa, India, and Central and South America. Indeed, right before I started teaching at University of Detroit this fall, um, I emailed her to ask her a few questions, sort of assuage my insecurity about starting the whole process. And uh, a couple weeks later, I got an email in which she apologized because she'd been in India, and she was just about to start teaching. She would make it just in time. So. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker. It gives me great pleasure, Dr. Gail Presby. Thank you for this warm welcome, and thank you to the Windsor Philosophical Association. I'm so glad to have a chance to share my ideas with Windsor philosophers and their friends gathered here. I'm really looking forward to our uh, dialogues and exchange as the evening goes on, and also to University of Windsor Philosophy Department. Already for years I've been telling our philosophy graduates at University of Detroit Mercy, when you're looking for graduate studies, go to University of Windsor. So I, I've been doing my best to send students your way, and we're very happy now to have Jeff Reno coming our way to help uh, teach our students at our university. So, I'm very glad to be here. This is my first World Philosophy Day talk. <laughs> so, um, let's see. And I'm going to be sharing with you some of my reflections on a recent book by Grace Lee Boggs, The Next American Revolution, Sustainable Activism for the 21st Century. So. So uh, this is the book, and it, it prompts a series of thoughts. So she wrote this book in 2001, and um, at the time she was uh, 96, now she's 97 years old. She was born June 27, 1915. And in this book, she traces her life trajectory, recounting the key philosophical ideas and justice struggles that shaped her. Her point is to show how she has come to a new understanding of what revolution means. And she describes an ongoing movement in Detroit, which she has helped to shape and inspire. It's important to know that Grace Lee Boggs is not only an author, she is a lifelong movement leader. And hundreds of activists, young and old, look to her for leadership and inspiration and gather regularly at her home in Detroit which doubles as a community center called the Boggs Center, or more fully, the James and Grace Lee Boggs Center to Nurture Community Leadership. Boggs, of Chinese descent and daughter of a restaurant owner, had studied philosophy at Bryn Mawr, getting her Ph.D. in 1940, writing on George Herbert Mead, and spent many years in New York City with the Workers' Party, since it considered itself uh, rejecting Soviet-style Marxism. Then she became a Johnsonite, joining the Johnson Forest Tendency, um, an a, a title based on pseudonyms, right? Um, influenced by C.L.R. James, who was going under the pseudonym Johnson because uh, being a communist, he was in danger of being thrown out of the U.S. <laughs> and Raya Dunyovskaya's humanistic reading of Marx, which she preferred to 19th century style static and counter-revolutionary interpretations of Marx, 
advocated by supporters of the Russian Revolution. In contrast, this small group, the Johnson Forest Tendency, believed that every cook could govern since, drawing upon Hegel, everyone is involved in a constant struggle in their search for freedom and self-determination. Reality is constantly changing, and so with it, the forms of Marxism appropriate to the situation. How did the Johnsonites form, and what did they do? C.L.R. James came from England to the United States in 1938, and after making a full circuit of speaking engagements to the various Trotskyist communities there, and after meeting Trotsky in Mexico City in 1939 and having some disagreements with him, James finally also broke away from the Trotskyists and started his own independent revolutionary organization. Associating with Grace Lee, later known as Grace Lee Boggs after she married Jimmy Boggs, and taking on the pseudonym of J.R. Johnson, he founded this splinter group. This group hoped that American workers would grasp the extent of contradictions in the capitalist system and organize a nationwide strike against the bourgeoisie. At first, as first concrete steps, they were involved in organizing American blacks to get their rights and for workers to achieve more human relationships within their factories and workplaces. While the group would spend many hours studying the texts of Hegel and Marx, they also listened to the workers. Grace Lee Boggs described James's approach. Quote, he could hold forth on a multitude of subjects, but he could also listen patiently to what people said and give it back with an enlarged meaning. As Freddie Payne used to say, he would pick our brains and then make a whole philosophical Megillah out of it. <laughs> Boggs liked Marx's materialism if it was understood not as consumerism, but as a practice of rooting ideas in real life. With Jimmy Boggs and others, she decided to move to Detroit in 1953. They wanted to learn about the workers, not through books or abstractions as the masses, but on a personal basis. They stuck together until CLR James left Detroit in 1962. Boggs said the disagreement was over the role of automation. Boggs thought there was a silver lining in automation and that it heralded the end of the industrial era so that people could again be close to nature. By sacrificing gains in material goods, people could instead work on transforming humanity, what she calls dialectical humanism, as in, quote, accelerating our evolution to a higher plateau of humanity, end quote. And that's where um, she gets that phrase of revolution and or evolution. She means evolution in that sense of dialectical humanism. In the 1950s, Detroit had already begun to suffer. After big wins for labor in the 1936-37 sit-down strikes in the GM and Fisher plants, that won gains for workers, the decades to come would see the big three automakers turn to automated production, relocating to the suburbs where white workers were able to follow them with subsidy from government for suburban development shielded from minority populations by racist real estate practices. As, so they relocated to the suburbs as well as the non-unionized South and eventually Mexico. She and her husband Jimmy Boggs witnessed big labor become big business, kicking the reds out of the union. This loss of jobs dramatically affected Detroit residents, especially African American community. People were told they were expendable, replaced by machines. White flight to the suburbs left a white police force in place in Detroit, which treated people like it was an occupying army. All of this was the background to the 1967 rebellion, as Boggs describes it. With virtue of hindsight that comes to a person 97 years old, she describes this 1967 as she saw it then as it unfolded and as she sees it now with the benefit of hindsight. At the time, she focused on the importance of angry rebellions that protested injustice. But after the rebellion was over, she and Jimmy Boggs reevaluated. From a position of supporting Malcolm X and black power, 
they shifted to an appreciation of King, not the watered-down, rosy recasting of King, and Gandhi. They decided it was not good to encourage angry rebellions, as they saw the shortcomings of Malcolm X's by all means necessary slogan as it was being interpreted as nothing but a call to meet violence with violence. She recounts that she and Jimmy had been close to and a part of Malcolm X's transformations of perspective in his last few years. Box wants to champion the introspective, questioning, and transforming Malcolm X that is often ignored by those who considered that themselves his followers. In contrast to this angry message, the Boggs's thought that what was really needed was the building of loving relationships. A new American dream would focus on reducing global inequalities between North and South. This new movement was something she compared to the Zapatista idea of revolution, rather than the old Marxist paradigm. Rather than think of ourselves as victims who need products from the state, like health care run by the medical industrial complex, we need to take responsibility for nurturing our own health through healthy growing of food, preparing and eating nutritious meals, and reducing violence through community building and sharing. She had a list of concrete projects for her Detroit neighborhood, including developing peace zones, changing children's education, and replacing punitive justice with restorative justice practices. Boggs describes long-standing collaborations with Detroit leaders like Ron Scott, who fought police brutality by finding community alternatives to calling the police. Often, police hurt people when they come to respond to domestic violence calls. If the community could be involved in addressing and defusing these family and community tensions, there would be less death and incarceration. Yusuf Shakur wrote his memoirs, tracing his early life as a criminal from Zone 8, that's zip code, 48208 in Detroit, a place with little resources for education or employment. So he made that transition to a community activist. Detroit Summer attempted to make education fun, putting kids' summers to good use learning in the context of their own neighborhoods, drawing on Deweyan and Frarian ideas of education for liberation, where kids can learn from elder generations while applying what they learn immediately to real life outside the four walls of a school. She mentioned as well Danny Glover's project called Positive Futures Network to encourage youth to develop their creativity. <coughs> Boggs wants to change our way of thinking about ourselves. She exhorts us to grow our souls, that we are involved in a protracted struggle during which our goal is to transform ourselves. She refers to nonviolent campaigns, such as the Montgomery bus boycott, and says they were as much about teaching and transforming individuals than they were about reaching a political goal. She says love and revolution have to be linked so that we can change our hyper-individualistic, materialistic, damaged selves. Joining mass protests is not transformative enough. We have to use our imaginations and live an alternative to materialistic life now. Boggs does not want people to engage in binary thinking. She wants a multiracial movement that binds allies from all races. In the earlier years, she was engaged in ensuring race representation in government, for example, supporting Coleman Young as Detroit's first black mayor. But she became disillusioned with this kind of emphasis on politics and representation, noticing that Young made some disastrous choices, like promoting the destruction of Pole Town, ostensibly to bring another factory and jobs to the Detroit area, but instead destroying a thriving neighborhood. Also, Young would invest in big projects like stadiums and casinos and dismiss the Boggses as naysayers to his development projects. Likewise, she argues that Obama can't create cities of hope. The Washington, D.C. government is dysfunctional, and the Oval Office is constrained in what it can do. 
The future of the planet is about us, not Obama. My t-shirt, Grace and Bugs t-shirt, we are the leaders we are looking for. <laughs> Sayings. The future of the planet is about us, not Obama. In fact, catastrophes like Katrina or the Iraq or Afghanistan wars are about us. Catastrophes created by our own ideas and actions. That's why we have to burn our credit cards and sever ourselves from the casino economy. She champions the phrase, oh yes, we are the leaders we are looking for, knowing people might be skeptical about the impact of all the seemingly small projects that she supports in the city. Boggs refers to Hart and Negri's ideas of the value of singularities. She also refers to Zapatista ideas, insisting her goal is finding a new way of living. Focusing on horizontal power as an alternative to patriarchal culture, she wants to create beloved communities. Now, I think Grace Lee Boggs is to be commended for creating and sharing a philosophy that is so clearly related to her own way of living, as well as forming a guide to living for others. As a lifelong activist, she can't be faulted for hiding in the elitist ivory tower. Her daily life is poor in material goods, but rich in relationships. Living in a big old house in a neighborhood of Detroit, where real estate is dirt cheap, and wearing comfortable functional clothes like jogging suits, and wearing old sweaters to be warm as the thermostat is turned down in winter. She is not rich in a monetary sense, but she is rich in relationships. Her house is never empty. She is surrounded by adoring supporters. And her walls are decorated with photos and news articles of her activities, which continue even to this day with a fast pace. Questions could be asked, nevertheless, about the approach which focuses on self-reliance rather than direct political change. Certainly its long-term goal would result in political change were it to be widely embraced. But in the short run, Boggs does not put her effort in electoral politics, with which she is clearly disillusioned, and perhaps with good reason. In her lifetime, she has not seen Detroit or the larger world be helped by mayors, governors, or the president. Likewise, her disillusion with vanguard Marxist parties in favor of Hart and Negri style singularities is frowned upon by contemporary socialists, but that position could also be considered to be the fruit of a lifetime of experience. As one uh, socialist critic says of Hart and Negri's turn at the end of Empire, to an idealized Saint Francis as a figure more relevant than Lenin to the world they want to see, uh, this uh, critic says, quote, lifestyle politics, setting the moral example, prefiguring utopia, these are the individualistic politics of middle-class radicals who are economically comfortable enough to abstain from collective struggle and who content themselves with the moralizing and illuminating the path of others should follow. The suggestion may make sense if you understand political militancy to mean what St. Francis evidently did, dressing down and moving to the projects, end quote. So these were very really dismissive, <laughs> dismissive criticisms of the way uh, Boggs, those are dismissive criticisms of Hart and Negri, but I think, you know, the question is, could these be, could this be a charge uh, put towards Boggs and her movement? She is decidedly not middle class, but could this turn to self-reliance be seen as quietism or conservatism? Whenever one is a minority, whether a socialist in America or African American in society dominated by white power and privilege, one has to make a decision to fight the big powers or to do something constructive on a small scale while relatively ignoring those powers. Starting community gardens or small employment enterprises like those seated by the Capuchins, a uh, reference to St. Francis here, uh, Boggs is very close to the, the Capuchins and their urban gardening, who started Earthworks Garden. Uh, these are time intensive. Is this where we should put our time and energy? Well, it seems to me that rather than an either or, our challenge is to have a both and approach. We don't want to burn out butting our heads against the walls of government bureaucracy. 
We want to address our immediate needs by creating community and addressing our survival and employment needs in a harsh environment. We want to humanize our immediate context, make it safer with less crime and more community support for those in need. But without addressing the larger context some of the time, our ability to create these alternatives is hampered. Government is not the answer and we are not mere victims, but government does sometimes have great resources which it could share more properly, and government has the ability to fashion laws that will make it easier for people to flourish. For example, while it's certainly true that we should take care of our daily health by eating nutritious food, exercising, and reducing stress, things within our control, especially with community effort, we could still benefit from a single-payer health care system for immediate medical emergencies. And yet we know that support for the single-payer system in current U.S. electoral politics is low. And you'll tell me about the Canada situation. <laughs> okay. There is the related question of funding for startup costs for projects. Shall the self-reliance movement rely on its own sources for startup money? Or can it take contributions from the government and or private foundations? If it takes money from others, how will these startup projects be able to protect themselves from undue influence of the donors in the shaping and running of its programs? Here it is important to realize that Boggs runs a leadership center Many of the new programs springing up in Detroit started as ideas in the Boggs Center or were directly or indirectly influenced by its philosophy of societal transformation. But there are also a lot of independent players and not all of the projects can be attributed to Boggs herself or the Boggs Center itself. Let's look first at education. Detroit Summer, which has run for many years, was a direct project of the Boggs Center. The idea was to have youth engage in learning activities through coordinating volunteer teachers in summer, and thereby, thereby avoiding the summer slump, which happens to all students, but is much worse for low-income students when they lack educational opportunities in summer. This past summer, 2012, their programs were sponsored by the Youth Connection which is a local nonprofit and funded by the National Summer Learning Association. <clears throat> now, the Boggs Center is incubating another education project, the Boggs Educational Center Charter School. This is an interesting development because, for a long time, activists involved with the Boggs Center were against the city's furtherance of charter schools as alternatives to the public school system arguing that charter schools were for the most part corporations that had profit as their goal. They lured the best students away from the public school system, leaving the public schools with an unruly and underachieving student body that would be neglected. Also, charter schools did not have to pay unionized faculty who had job security like those in Detroit public schools, meaning teachers could be underpaid so that the charter school could make profits. Despite this criticism of charter schools, the public school situation in Detroit seemed mired in problems. The few schools that served as promising alternatives to business as usual, such as Catherine Ferguson Academy, that had a thriving urban gardens program for its pregnant and young mothers who were its students, were radically altered or closed altogether under the emergency manager law. So Catherine Ferguson became a charter school. In this context, the Boggs Educational Center decided to take advantage of procedures for setting up charter schools in order to open a school of its own, based on Deweyan and Frarian educational models. Young teachers disillusioned with Detroit public schools or unemployed will be the teachers of the school, which will involve radical pedagogy. In a city with 47% functional illiteracy, where three-quarters of the youth do, not, youth do not graduate high school, and with the city facing a large deficit, um, 300 million in 2009, is, it could be more now. These dedicated teachers are going to open a school devoted to 
nurture creative, critical thinkers who are empowered to contribute to the well-being of their communities. Community will be the students' classroom, the founders of the school assert. They call it place-based education. Literacy will not just be measured by tests, since literacy is, quote, a skill that goes beyond competence in reading and writing and includes media, technology, and even our emotions, end quote. This ability to communicate in all these ways will overcome the muteness of our, our society exercises when it comes to youth of color. The project team for starting this school consists of Julia Putnam, who attended Detroit Summer as a teenager in 1992 and is a writer, as well as Amanda Rossman, who uses her law background to help get the school chartered, and Marisol Teachworth, an act activist and ESOL teacher, English as Second Language teacher. The school plans to open in fall of 2013. We're turning now to the topic of urban gardening. I think it's important <coughs> to move on to a statistical overview of the city of Detroit to get some sense of the magnitudes of the problems of the city. You may all be familiar with this from your first-hand experiences, but these are some statistics, or we're seeing the film. Okay, a 2010 report called The Fiscal Condition of the City of Detroit, quoted by the University of Detroit Mercy Detroit Collaborative Design Center, said, there are 33,529 vacant single or multiple family housing units, and 91,488, or 26% of the city's 343,000 residentially zoned lots have no buildings on them. Okay, 26% no buildings on them. Between 1992 and 2002, Detroit lost 39% of its manufacturing establishments. The city was recently declared a food desert, an area that has a low to no access to healthy, fresh, affordable food, an area of relative exclusion where people experience physical and economic barriers to accessing healthy food. The unemployment rate is over twice that of the state. Um, nearly one third of residents and more than half of Detroit families with children live at or below poverty. Okay, so these are some of the overviews. The city has been left with approximately 40 square miles of unproductive vacant land. Unemployment in Detroit currently exceeds 30%, according to these statistics. Well, only 1 in 44 persons eligible for drug treatment are provided with it. So these are some of the statistics my university has put together on the city. While Detroit may be famous for the extent of its problems, it's important to realize that the city is not an anomaly. So they also note that Detroit is 32nd in a long list of 374 cities worldwide that have sustained a shrinking production population over a 50-year period. There are 59 cities in the United States alone that have shrunk. Okay. <coughs> Given high unemployment rates and lack of nutrition, as well as available vacant land, the urban gardening movement has taken off in Detroit. But it has been unnecessarily hampered by a lack of cooperation with the city. One example of this conundrum has to do with the practice of selling vacant lots. Those who want to do urban gardening would prefer to own the land on which they will have to work for years in order to get the soil in shape for farming. But city planners are not officially in favor of urban gardening. Their practice is to easily sell a homeowner one lot adjacent to their house, but they are reluctant to sell more. This even though there is a very high rate of vacancy in the city. For example, Brightmoor, an area in northwest Detroit to which many interested in urban gardening have moved, has 7,000 7, 737 houses, down 1,600 units from 1990. It has an 11% vacancy rate of standing home. Almost half of houses in Brightmoor are financed with subprime mortgages, and almost half of Brightmoor residents pay more than 30% of their income for housing. 
However, those interested in urban gardening or vacant lots have not been allowed to buy more than one adjacent lot, since the city government will only sell to those who say they will build infill housing. So farmers squat on land that they don't own, which falls short of sustainable standards. And I have, I have several friends who have moved to Brightmoor and done this uh, urban gardening. And these are the kinds of problems, the official problems they have to face. Uh, but they, ha they have built a community and they have community support there. Likewise, while the University of Detroit Mercy Architecture Program called Detroit Collaborative Design Center, came up with a creative plan for reuse of land in Detroit's Near East neighborhoods, turning vacant lots into parks and farms. The plan sat on the shelf or had been politely declined by the city's leadership for many years. It was only recently, since 2008, that their plans, modified, have begun to work, and that with the help of the Self-Help Addiction Rehabilitation uh, SHAR, a program that received some government funds. They were able to get grants from the Skillman Foundation and the Kresge Foundation to do a study of the city called City Connect Detroit and Data Driven Detroit. They now have a plan called Recovery Park with farmers markets and other community buildings, a plan that would be sure to attract more people to a neighborhood drastically losing population. The idea is that with addiction being such a widespread problem in the city, it can't be addressed without focusing on the larger problems of the city. But it is interesting that a broke city government increasingly needs the money resources of private foundations to be able to remodel, remodel the city on any kind of large scale. So. Uh, my university is involved in this program, and they are trying their best to make it democratic, but every so often you hear people say, it's not democratic enough. We go to an audience and we're supposed to click on something to give feedback, and so they're trying, but you know, not everybody is satisfied, but it's, it's an attempt. It's an attempt to deal with these big problems in Detroit. And it gets funding from grants that come through my university into these projects. Now, these are not the only uh, necessary uh, city, uh, it's not only city planning that needs resources that ends up being funded by grants. This summer, the city government had to rely upon uh, grants to hire back city firefighters who were laid off due to a stressed city budget. Grant writers wrote a Detroit Public Safety Fund and they worked with the Detroit Fire Department to write a grant to SAFER, Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response of FEMA, and were awarded enough money to hire back first 108 firefighters and then a second grant, an additional 26 firefighters laid off in August. So this is the situation of the city having to apply for grants to try to hire back uh, firefighters who are laid off. At the same time, the city drags its feet when it comes to passing legislation or engaging in practices to encourage urban gardens and community development in a park downtown in Detroit on a lot created from a torn down historic building, Lafayette Greens, a park funded by CompuWare and designed by Kenneth Wickle Landscape Architecture, a downtown city block recreated a Disneyland style mock urban garden, at least tipping its hat to the idea that Detroit is becoming famous for its urban gardening movement. Now, uh, philosopher Fred Evans has already analyzed Millennium Park in Chicago and noticed that it was a troubling example of a trend of seeming public spaces like parks being funded and therefore controlled by private corporations. Evans noted that people didn't seem to mind that their nice park was funded by corporations, but he worried nevertheless that by handing over government functions to private corporations, our citizenship was being reduced. He drew upon the analysis of Paul Jaska, who argued that parks with such privately funded art, quote, naturalize the simultaneity and compatibility of social values and capital interests, end quote. Evans notes, that while the individual artworks in the Chicago Park have democratic themes in their designs, and that they are interactive, 
while resisting imposed unity. Uh, perhaps examples of Deleuzean chaosmos, according to Evans, and thereby an alternative to the overawing art of the spectacle that dwarfs individuals. Nevertheless, the point of a park such as this one is to make Chicago a global tourist destination to attract finance capital. So we also have this problem in Detroit. Um, our ca uh, campus marshes and so many of our nice parks uh, funded by corporations, and then you find out you can't engage in freedom of speech in those, spark, in those parks because they have their own security guards who will move you along yeah. if you dare <laughs> to even walk on the sidewalk on the outside of the park. Mm -hmm. And so there go our public spaces. Uh, one of the newest and very beautiful parks in Detroit, development of the riverfront, was likewise funded by private donors. Detroit Riverfront Conservancy gets donations from individuals and corporations. Even the Renegade Heidelberg Project, an ongoing art installation by local and now famous artist Tyree Guyton, has won a grant of $50,000 uh, to create a cultural village and a $100,000 grant from Space for Change Planning and Development in 2011. Are all these grants good? In context of short resources, they each seem like a godsend. Specifically calling upon the earlier projects of the Mondragon Cooperatives, as well as the Evergreen Cooperatives in Cleveland, Ohio, the UDM project is in its early stages, organizing a series of conversations with city residents before finalizing the project design. The UDM project praises projects already underway in Cleveland. Uh, and I recently heard a presentation of the Cleveland Project's uh, Sustainable Cleveland uh, 2019 at a, at a recent conference I was at. The project run by the Cleveland City Government began in 2009, but ha had discussions with community members and stakeholders. The stakeholders include, quote, corporate executives, small business owners, blue-collar workers, civic leaders, etc to brainstorm about how they could design and develop a thriving and resilient Cleveland region that leverages its wealth of assets to build economic, social, and environmental well-being for all. The city government wants to draw upon the imaginations of its residents and uses a process called Impreciate Inquiry with five steps, definition, discovery, dream, design, and deliver. They have goals regarding energy efficiency, growing local food, reducing waste, building sustainable water and transportation systems, and making neighborhoods vital. So, I mean, it's, it seems like so much is happening in Cleveland compared to Detroit. Then if you look, you see sponsors of the project include Agribank, Nortech, Vitamix, Cleveland State University, Cleveland Airport System, and a host of others. The city government hires full-time staff to oversee new small businesses incubated as part of the Sustainable Cleveland Project. So while it is great to see a project of this scale actually embraced by the city, and therefore also hopefully receiving funds and being implemented, the project is again one where broke cities turn to cooperation by businesses to provide citizens what they need for survival as well as thriving. Is this realistically the future for projects like the ones the Bog Center promotes? Once one partners with business leaders, the project may no longer seem as it first did during its grassroots incubation. But this may be the only opportunity in cash-strapped communities. In a disorienting context where non-profit non organizations like the Oxford Foundation of Michigan can get its non-profit status due to its IRS-approved charitable purpose of, quote, lessening the burden of government, end quote. Boo. It is hard to trust nonprofits as an umbrella group, although particular nonprofits may still be doing valuable work. And while people in Michigan democratically defeated the emergency manager proposal one in these recent November 2012 elections, with 52.7% voting no. It seems that the proposal will not end the, the rule of emergency managers, unless, of course, we continue to take to the streets. 
since the state government intends to write new legislation to keep such uh, emergency managers in power. In these troubling times, it may be that Boggs's dual advice to critique and fight the powers while building community and alternative lifestyles in the meantime is a good direction in which to proceed. Thank you all. Great, thanks very much. So we have, uh, we'll have a commentary by one of our professors here at the University of Windsor. Um, he's professor of philosophy and the head of the department here. Uh, apart from being one of the most inspiring people I've seen speak, and I mean that, uh, he's also a longtime activist and writer. He was recently taken to exploring different forms of writing other than the typical journal directed philosophical work. Uh, in his, on his new blog, jeffnewton.org, which I urge you all to check out. Um, for those of you who don't know, he's published three books, Critical Humanism, Politics of Difference, Democratic Society and Human Needs, and more recently, Materialist Ethics and Life Value. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeff Newman. The problem with such kind introductions is that you have to live up to them. <laughs> Um, I just want to take a moment to uh, thank both Grant and Jeff for their hard work bringing World Philosophy Day out of the university into the community, um, but also say a few words of thanks to all of you. There's an amazing diversity of people here who are connected in different ways through the ideas that we've come to discuss. There are current and former students, there are people from the community, there are faculty, there are retired faculty, there are uh, faculty members from different departments, there are graduates uh, of our program. Uh, it's a wonderful gathering. Um, I, my comments are not so much a direct commentary on Gail's paper, although I do have a few things to say about it. What I really wanted to do was use it as an occasion to talk more generally about what World Philosophy Day is and how that can transform our own thinking about philosophy. Right? Because I think Gail's paper, and I'll come back to this in a bit more detail in a moment, is a brilliant instance of showing that philosophy is thinking that has its feet on the ground. Right? It's not a flight to the ivory tower, although it does ask people to allow us to look at things from a different perspective. And that's what I think people find difficult about philosophy sometimes. It's not there solving things yesterday, right? But it's a suggestion that we might be able to do a better job solving things if we allow people a moment to look from up here, but still being very connected to what's happening on the ground. So my comments are fairly brief, um, and I'm going to um, <clears throat> work through them. In the discussion, though, since Gail is our guest and she is you know, the, the kind of primary speaker, I'm not taking any questions. Please <laughs> address them to Gail. <laughs> That's my gift to my friend, right? Because we owe people the respect of, of interrogating her. Um, <laughs> But thanks to Gail for coming out. I, I, I don't even know how, it's been eight or nine years since we've known each other now, Gail. I, I, I met Gail through the magic of, of websites. I was, the, uh, I was running the Visiting Speakers program about eight or nine years ago. And I was just trying to find interesting people from, from the uh, general area, because we don't have a lot of money uh, in the philosophy department. And I came upon Gail's webpage at the University of Detroit Mercy, so I sent her an email. Uh, and she came and gave a fantastic talk about African philosophy. Uh, but since then, she's become a great friend to the department and a great friend to me. So uh, it's an instance of, of you know, ideas drawing people together, which I think uh, is their ultimate justification. So, here we go. Philosophy, Hegel famously said, is its own time comprehended in thought. World Philosophy Day reminds us that philosophy is also an intervention in the space in which it develops. Just as time and space form a continuum in the physical universe, so do comprehension and intervention form a continuum in the philosophical universe. It was to remind the world that philosophy is not an invention of the Western Academy, quiet and domesticated, 
but the emergent product of human thought loudly intervening in diverse historical and social contexts that UNESCO declared the third Thursday of November World Philosophy Day. UNESCO's de declaration of a World Philosophy Day is not, therefore, a denial that philosophies are always grounded in concrete social spaces. Instead, it is meant to put us in mind, first, of the cultural diversity of the sources of philosophy. At the same time, by calling it World Philosophy, not Philosophies Day, I believe that UNESCO is also urging us to think through this diversity to the underlying unity of purpose that distinguishes philosophy. That unity of purpose shared by all philosophies is to enable people to think systematically upon the real metaphysical, natural, social, and ethical conditions of human life. Understood as a practice of systematic reflection, philosophy is not the preserve of any one culture, but part of the heritage of humanity, a heritage which is the outcome of diverse practical and symbolic labors of diverse peoples across historical time and cultural space. Insofar as it is a practice of reflection, of making a given natural and social reality an object of thought, philosophy, no matter what its expressed political principles, cannot, by its very nature, leave everything as it is. For as soon as we take the world as an object of thought, we cancel the ontological gulf between mind and thing. Once we cancel the ontological gulf between mind and thing, we realize that the world need not be accepted as given, but can be interrogated, questioned, criticized, and perhaps changed. As philosophy comprehends a given time and a definite space, so too does it unite theory and practice, and this in two senses. On the one hand, conceptual thought is a distinguishing practice of human beings. Our world is not simply the world of physical elements, dynamics, and processes. The human world is this world categorized, classified, interpreted, judged, and evaluated in various ways. And categorization, classification, interpretation, judgment, and evaluation are the practices of thought. These practices of thought are not ends in themselves, but guide those material practices through which the social world is built up and changed. Without ideas, strategies, and goals, there can be no human activity, and without human activity, there is no human world of institutions, meanings, and values, even though there would still be a material world of elements, dynamics, and processes. These elements, dynamics, and processes are made into the human world through cooperative human labor, which is guided by definite conceptions as goals in the context of theories that tell us what is possible and value systems that frame what is legitimate. <laughs> this is the advantage of taking philosophy to the community. You can have a beer rather than coffee. <laughs> These institutions and value systems, it's a product of human labor. There's nothing bad about it. These institutions and value systems, diverse as they have been across historical time and cultural space, share this trait in common. Each projects its reign as normal, natural, and good. And from the perspective of abstract thought, there is no basis to contest these claims. It is only the test of real life that poses challenges to the legitimacy and goodness of different, different, uh, different social forms. The only truly effective criticism of way of life is that it ceases to work. At the point where some sort of structural crisis emerges, a new task for philosophy arises. To understand its depth causes, and by comprehending them, to clear the way for new value systems and institutions to overcome the impasse. It is precisely when the contradictions of society have hardened to the point of irreconcilability, Hegel argued, that philosophy is called forth. We inhabit such a moment, and Gale's paper is a contribution to getting us beyond it. And it is in this light, I think, that we should examine its central claims. Gale brings to light the transformative role Grace Lee Boggs has played in Detroit. As Boggs' work is ongoing and nearby, it is easy for people to go get involved with it themselves, so I need not say anything more about it. Instead, I want to talk about what that work means for philosophy and how it might affect us in the space where we are, Windsor, connected to but distinct from our neighbors across the river. It no, might, it no doubt might strike some that Boggs' work in the community is a repudiation of her philosophical background. The messiness of life down on the ground, the difficulty of comprehending general social problems when one is face to face with its individual victims, might seem to some to explain why people flee to the heights of philosophical speculation, 
where abstraction reigns and conclusions can be neatly derived from following the rules of inference. But as anyone who has tried to derive conclusions that mean something just by following the rules of inference will tell you there is no escaping messiness and complexity and ambiguity. Though some might like philosophy to be an escape, it is not, and the best of it has never thought of itself as such. Gale's paper is an instance of philosophy doing the hard work of trying to understand local problems in light of universal values without negating the specificity of the local. And a discussion of philosophy in the, purpose, uh, in the person of Boggs and her foundation making a real difference in a specific community by giving flesh to alternative values. There can be no institutional alternative without alternative values to guide their construction. And philosophy in a time of crisis is the source of those alternative values, even if not everyone who asserts them would call herself a philosopher or think of what he is doing as philosophy. What Gale's paper so movingly brings to light is that values are material realities every bit as real as electrical charge and mass. The value of education is nothing apart from the institutions and relationships through which we educate one another. The genius of Gale's paper, and more so the work of Boggs, uh, the Boggs Center that it discusses, is that it makes this very complicated philosophical argument concrete. It makes it real for us and therefore easy to understand. We just have to look at the work actually accomplished, how it is the realization of cooperative labor in the service of an alternative set of values generated by the demonstrable failures of the social life support systems in Detroit. But we are not in Detroit, although we are linked in historical, social, economic, and cultural ways to it. So in order to understand the lessons that Gale's paper and Boggs' work teaches, we in Windsor have to think concretely about the contours of social and economic failure here and how we can intervene to, to paraphrase the slogan of the Windsor Workers Action Center, and I think Paul is here somewhere, the director, uh, rebuild our community from the ground up. To work out specific projects or to further those already underway is not the purpose of tonight's gathering. Rather, it is to reflect upon what philosophy really is. Reflection and intervention into the real, not flight from it. Without philosophical reflection and intervention, all problems become technical problems, and the experts assure us they alone are competent to resolve them. Philosophy, in contrast, is not expertise. It is not the preserve of a few. It is a vocation of critical engagement whose practice is open to all. When people become alive to that human vocation, they at the same time become alive to the real problems affecting their lives, where those lives are being led. And so philosophy unites thinking people everywhere in the search for understanding and solutions in the time and in the place where life is being lived right now. Thank you. Okay, so th thanks very much again, Dr. Nair, for doing that. So if uh, I don't know if you'd like to, if anyone has questions for, for Gail about what's happening in Detroit to elaborate on some of the things she was discussing. Of course, we have all night to talk about these things. I think, Frank, 2, 2 a.m.? <laughs> 2, okay. Can't I can't leave no. until 2, Gail. That's right. Yeah, we got you. <laughs> questions, Stephen? So, let's say Detroit, like Windsoria, is a late capitalist laboratory in which the experimentation that is so dear to neoliberalism takes shape over and over again through the dying of cities, through the disappearance of manufacturing and all of that. Let's just accept that. I think it's pretty easy to do so. How does... What is the space between making a garden next to your house and the, the, the global forces of late capitalism. What is that middle space? Now, I, I can see the, the, the fight for local rights, you know, to take down a house or to expropriate land as important to, uh, uh, you know, m making a community. That's, that's perfectly fine. But the forces of capitalism 
don't give a shit about community gardens. Let's be perfectly frank here. Okay. So what's the middle ground? Where is the middle ground between tending your own garden, as it were, and intervening in that system which is continuing, continuing to desecrate the city of Detroit? Thank you. That's, that's a great question. And uh, these are the kinds of issues that were also raised. I originally gave this paper, and Jeff heard me give this paper at Radical Philosophy Association Conference. And I asked the same question. <laughs> <laughs> and so in that context, people are... We have a lot of people who are saying, you know, capitalism will not work, and they will definitely convince you. Um, but then what do you do if you say, I'm not going to try to prop up capitalism, I want socialism. But what do you do in the short run? And so many people at that conference said, well, in the short run, your actions are indistinguishable. Because you can't just say, now starting now, we'll have nothing to do with capitalism. You can just inch it, inch it in another direction. And so I think what this movement in community gardens is, is it's, the idea is not to be apolitical, to, to be political, but it's all a matter of judging your time, balancing your time, so you don't get burnout, out, but still trying to have that impact, because you can't just cede government to forces that are going to create even more decimation for the city. So you have to try to, to reach that government, but how do you do it? Because people, so many people are supporting that government because it's in their culture, because of their conversations, because of the way they spend their day. And so then that's affecting the kind of government they want and what they want in the voting booth and how they're supporting laws or not supporting laws. So all of this community building is intending to, to create a home and, and an attractive place for people to be drawn in to change their ideas and change their way of thinking, which is an indirect way of changing them politically. And it works on two levels, because you have the de those who are demoralized in Detroit who see no future and don't know where they're going to get a job, and so they need community not only to get some food to eat, but to have some hope and a, a reason to struggle. And then you need uh, those, you know, um, from outside the city, the outer suburbs, to come into the city and be challenged about their lifestyle and their distance, and challenged to be drawn in, if not get up and move, which some of them get up and move, at least uh, change your politics to, uh, to go in the other direction. And so that's how I think these two movements can work in, in tandem. And so that's, that's what I mean by uh, uh, tr taking from both this, uh, this middle ground, doing both, uh, because either one just by itself um, may not be productive of the kind of change we want to see. Yes? I would like to know how you yourself, as well as the box, uh, Because as far as I know, I mean, Fox has been saying, forget them. Right. Um, well, or at least, right, don't put, put all your hope in. There are, there are different people, right? So many people vote for Obama, and they say, let's vote for him because we can continue to try to change him and continue to try to influence him in a better direction, and you could say, what, you know, what other choice do we have? So we have that, and I mean, I was interested, so many people were like all a sigh of relief, you know, okay, you know, we, we didn't get Romney, it was a sigh of relief, but to not fall into that lull of presuming that because Obama is there, everything is going to go well, you have to keep fighting, and uh, Angela Davis spoke a month ago, in Detroit, and, and this is the kind of thing, she was up there, here she was, you know, from the Communist Party, speaking in a 
church, a Christian church, telling everybody, vote for Obama, whatever it is. You know, so I thought, wow, this is an interesting mix. Um, and when she said, you know, last time we voted for Obama, we should have been there the next day protesting him. And I thought, you know, I was, because back then, I joined this movement shut down Guantanamo for 100 days. There was a vigil, so I was there at least a couple of days in the orange jumpsuit saying, okay, Obama, you said you were going to shut down, you know. So I feel like, well, didn't we protest him? But nevertheless, you know, we, but, but we have to change the conversation. There's, there's such a lot of work to do. Uh, all you have to do is go out to, to this, you know, outside of the city at any distance, and you realize the cultural and community work we have to do, reaching out to people and getting them to change the way they've been comfortable living and comfortable thinking. And so that's going to continue, and that's our challenge. Yes. <laughs> Let's get student questions for a minute. Any students? We should have started with them. Mark Buckner is a student. I'm not a student. I've lost her life. Um, well, one second. Well, no, I'll say it. I first met Grace Lee Boggs when she was only in her 60s. And okay. Probably would have been at the home of uh, the late Marty Glaberman, who was somewhat of a mentor of mine, who was a living link to the Johnson Ford's tendency, as you mentioned. He took over right. the publishing of some of the works of James and everything. Uh, we tried to continue that work, and one of the things we always looked at, and what was part of the rejection of the Vanguard idea, look for what's happening. Look for the independent movements that are happening, and see what you can do as intellectuals, activists, or philosophers to support those movements and move them along. And at the time, I mean, there was a student movement, the women's movement, the, the, you know, black, various black movements on the larger scale, but there's also small, you know, sometimes neighborhood-centered, very small things that could be called movements, sometimes around one issue. And we always looked for that and tried to publicize that and put that together. Now, I guess, to make it a question, has Grace moved beyond that and either rejected that or said that's not happening anymore? Because I get the sense that nobody really sees movements out there. Okay, urban gardening perhaps can be seen as that, but it seems more of, I'm kind of more talking about a, some self-help thing. And I, and I guess what it is is, if you look at it one way, it's almost a sense of despair that, that we felt, we always felt that these movements would all reach some sort of a point where capitalism, capitalism if you will, or at least the, the corporate system would get overthrown and then what would replace it would be the movements, people working together and organizing themselves. Now it seems more there's a view that it's going to fall apart from its own creaking, I mean, you know, climate change and the fiscal cliff and everything's going to happen and then we're in that apocalyptic situation where people are foraging through the remains of the city, you know, trying to grow food and stuff. Um, I, know, I know Grace is a an optimist through and through, and yes. in the field. But can you comment on that? Is it, do you feel that, that sense that there's still like people working out there, or is there sort of that sense of despair? And it's you know. Well, I mean, you're right. She she is somebody with so much enthusiasm. So <laughs> I wouldn't say. Yeah, I mean, she may despair of certain kinds of changes, but she doesn't despair of change, and she doesn't despair of promoting new ideas. She doesn't necessarily, she wants to, to help promote other people's creativity, young people's creativity. So she's, she's not just saying, I have, you know, I have the idea, just follow my plan. But she latches on to young people and promotes them and encourages them and she wants creative responses. Now, I, I know what you mean when you, you know, look at Wow, Grace Lee Boggs has been working all these years, and look at Detroit, it still has all these problems, you know. And, and so I can despair, but I don't think she, she does. Um, I mean, no, I wouldn't say I, I'm just A to Z despair, but I, I can have moments, right, where you say, is this a drop in the bucket? You know, the larger trend is it's going the wrong way, and how can... Uh, some gardening jobs take the place of the kinds of jobs that have already left. Um, so, so I have those uh, uh, questions, uh, but, there's, but, but what she likes to do is she likes to think she is nurturing, you know, 
of nurturing growth of those she encounters and and see, and see what they can do. Can they open a storefront? Can they open a school? Can they, you know, and that, that's the, the role she's taken. And you've known her a lot longer than me, although I'm from Detroit originally, I, I went away for 20 years. So it was really only when I came back in 2000, when I started this job at University of Detroit Mercy, that I got to know her and I would see her at our protests. It's not like I never saw her at protests. We were protesting Afghanistan and Iraq wars and she was out there. So, um, but she's just somebody who would rather, you could say, focus on, on the positive, um, at, at least at this stage in our life. The back. Uh, mine's more uh, looking for advice than a question, but um, being a young person today and living in the society that we live in today, um, there's a lot of distractions that young people are faced with that uh, blind them from the reality that they're actually living in. So looking for advice to you in order to, to mobilize students, how do you open up their minds to what's actually happening in the world around them. Renaissance literature. You <laughs> <laughs> say drugs. <laughs> no, thank you so much for your question. And, uh, and there are so many opportunities um, for our students at my university, young people in general, to learn from coming to Detroit and participating in things, like meeting concrete people and being influenced by them. But in, in a way, what has happened, uh, perhaps you were alluding to this, is the young generation gets so uh, into the social media. I, I, will, okay. I, I don't want to, since this might be online, I don't want to help. <laughs> 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 But, uh, you know, the younger generation who's just stuck to texting the whole time and you almost get used to remote location and, uh, and wanting to join political movements that happen online that might not be the, the, the soundest. For example, just uh, last week at my university, the Invisible Children Coney 2012 folks came to our campus and you know there's a, a movie that everybody was galvanized even if you hadn't studied you know, African history, African politics, uh, the movie just grips you emotionally and you feel like I must stop Coney and I'm going to join this group. And, uh, and but it can be so cut off from the rest of your life if you haven't been in a community that discusses Africa, a community that has African members in it who you can learn from, um, other kinds of, of chances to be p political that are based on, on the local. Let's get together and do something. And uh, so... So in some ways, being at college is a missed opportunity if you don't have, you know, if you are, are, are living in community, even if you're not, you know, this is an opportunity to get to know each other and to, to plan together. And one of my students who wrote, you know, a little a reflection said, you know, I'm so busy. You know, we had a speaker who said, this is your chance, uh, uh, Prexy Nesbitt, last night. He said, We've got to discuss racism. We're all young people. Get to know each other. You're all in this room. And my one student said, you know, we're so busy. I don't really have time, you know, to stay on campus and get to know the other students on my campus. How are we going to tackle, you know, issues of racism, overcoming our ideas, our negative ideas about each other, coming together with common projects to help Detroit if we're all so busy because of our commitments 
and because of these d distractions, you say that we can't meet people face to face. So I'm not saying that technology can't help. It certainly can, but it, it can't uh, take that. We can't lose the opportunities to get to know each other, which is why it's so great to have this kind of opportunity. Local, we're getting to know each other. We're getting to discuss with each other, and it's it's the kind of thing that's, that I think uh, really has to happen more. And it's a good thing you're here, so you can get to know these folks and. Do something together. Yeah. Maybe uh, one more if there was? Yeah. Okay, and um, then we can all talk after, afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I was wondering about, in recent years, uh, this, the push to outsource everything has resulted in a variety of companies that are dedicated factories without dedicated products that produce a wide variety of items and that are now increasingly opening up individuals who want to use them for small run manufacturing. And this has been grown into the maker movement where you have a single person or several people running, starting a small manufacturing business without having a, their own factory. Um, I, w I was wondering if you have seen this happening and how the role that you feel this can play in the urban renewal. No, that and we we need um, well. I don't necessarily know about the small the small f business that depends on a factory. There is the whole question of s uh, small businesses coming together, and now you're adding this this aspect about uh, the factory, which is which is a good one. Um, I can only say we. Uh, Insofar as I've known people for years who've talked about cooperative employment and people who come together and they say we're all unemployed but we have great ideas, let's come together and not build a hierarchical business but uh, a business where we, we all come together and cooperate together. So all of those businesses I think are are good and, and we, we need more of them. Now, I would also say, well, it would also be good if there were, you know, some, some government dedicated resources that try to uh, change, you know, for example, when it comes to um, alternatives to oil and, you know, looking for solar and wind power and renewable sources. So right now you have government laws that are, you know, they give the discount to oil. It's going to be hard for your small business that wants to do some alternative to compete. Okay, but I'm so, sorry. I, I'm not a philosopher. I don't mean to cut in, but I think that the idea is great about outsourcing, but of course it kills the unions, and this is a big problem because the unions drive the big business. And if we kill the union by letting the small guy make stuff in his garage, then we fuck up the whole capitalist system. Okay, um, I think so that's uh, the point at which we start to <laughs> break off the topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Well, I can just say one Great thing. Way. Because, I mean, cooperatives, if you have a cooperative that is run as an egalitarian thing, it's not a, against unions, it's an example of the kind of thing, you know, the kind of reasons we wanted unions so that people have non exploitative relationships. Now, whether that business would then undermine a union, that's something that we would have to, you know, be concerned about. We don't want to undermine unions. On the other hand, you know, we have to think about, you know, which of our, you know, unions are, are doing, uh, have progressive agendas, you know, that are really uh, we all help do. the people. All unions do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Really? There's still a big part of Absolutely. Whatever way you look at it. Okay, now I don't want to undermine unions. Um, in fact, I mean, it's very upsetting that Prop 2 uh, didn't uh, pass in Michigan. Uh, but there, but there's also a room for people to come together. Um, you know, that charter school in Boggs is also controversial because, you know, there's Detroit Teachers Union, but they came to this point saying, well, we don't we don't want to destroy the teachers union, but we want to use this 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 opportunity for creativity we can't find in, in the other system. And so, 
there can be perhaps some of both. And on that note, that concludes the World Philosophy Day. But stick around, talk amongst each other, argue. We don't have to philosophize anymore. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, yeah. Cheers. Okay.